everyone, this is S. E. Coleman, author, and in this video I am going to be doing something a little different, and this will be a presentation titled Important Documents of the False Government. Now, <clears throat> a brief overview of what this is about is a, essentially, it's simply a list of certain documents that while they are apparently innocent or, uh, well, some of them anyway, might not appear to be of any importance, when all the documents are put together, they show a theme. And so that's what we're going to look at here in this video today. Our first section that we're going to look at is titled Law. And this is going to be the apparent foundation of the chain of documents and will show us exactly from what position all these subsequent documents are coming from. Now the first one is not actually the document itself, but rather it's essentially commentary on the document. Coming from Trade and Empire, the British Customs Service in America, 1660 to 1775, by Thomas C. Barrow, Harvard University Press, Cambridge, Massachusetts, 1967. And the documents that it's going to be talking about are specifically the Stamp Acts from the colonial period. And fortunately, we have to use uh, essentially uh, secondary sources on this because actually getting our hands on that original document could prove problematic and also there's no way we could be certain of the authenticity if we even did find the original stamp acts of the colonial period. Now the second document that we'll be looking at is the actual document itself as far as I can tell anyway but it is a PDF downloaded online. Now, the implications of what it's stating inside make it appear like the or official or original thing. This is the United States Stamp Duties, containing all the acts of Congress and decisions of Commissioner of Internal Revenue relating thereto, carefully compared with and corrected by official copies of the same. San Francisco, published by Kenny and Alexander, Bookseller of Stationers, number 606, Montgomery Street, 1863. Now, the last one under this section of law is, are the 1917 or Pio Benedictine Code of Canon Laws in English translation with extensive scholarly apparatus published by P.J. Kennedy and Sons, New York, 1918, copyright 2001, Ignatius Press, San Francisco. And so here with this information, you can go and look up all, all three of these documents, well, at least the... Uh, well, you could look up the book, anyway, that talks about the Stamp Acts from the colonial period. But here for this video, we are simply going to highlight the appropriate section. Now, here we get the cover for Trade and Empire. Again, it's uh, Thomas E. Barrow, 1967, Harvard University Press, Cambridge, Massachusetts, British Customs Service in Colonial America, 1660 through 1775. Here on page 198, it states the Stamp Act was an integral part of the Granville program. It was designed to provide the revenue needed to support the imperial projects through the assessment of internal taxes in the colonies. Many years earlier, the governor of New York, on hearing a project extend to extend the stamp tax to the colonies, warned that the people in North America are quite strangers to any duty but such as they raise themselves. The Grenville Ministry ignored such cautions, and in one decisive act imposed an internal stamp tax on the colonies. The resultant uproar surprised even experienced colonial officials with its intensity. N news of the passage of the Stamp Act was at first greeted with an outburst of angry oratory. Patrick Henry rose to immediate intercolonial fame on the news of the stand he had taken in Virginia House of Burgesses in support of resolutions condemning the action of Parliament. At the suggestion of the Massachusetts Assembly, an intercolonial meeting was summoned, the famous Stamp Act Congress. 
From this assembly came resolutions denying the right of Parliament to impose internal taxes on the colonies and requesting immediate repeal. Interestingly, two of the 13 resolutions concerned the previous Acts of Parliament as well as the Stamp Act. Article 9 complained that the duties imposed by several late Acts of Parliament were extremely burdensome and grievous, and the collection of them absurdly impracticable because over of the shortage of specie. The 11th article stated that the restrictions imposed by the several late Acts of Parliament on the trade of these colonies will render them unable to purchase the manufactures of Great Britain. There was some thought given at the Congress to demanding the repeal of all the Acts of Trade as well as the Stamp Act. But the majority settled for an express denial of Parliament's right to impose internal taxes with no direct statement regarding its right to regulate trade through the collection of duties. <laughs> By autumn of 1765, it was clear that the colonists intended to make a determined stand against the Stamp Act. When the names of those appointed to collect the new taxes became known, they were burned in effigy, some forced to resign their commissions, while the homes and property of others were damaged by rioters. There was no doubt as to... And here on the next page, 199 what the colonists would do when the stamps first arrived. But there was a question as to what the various royal officers would do. The first cargo of stamps arrived in Boston in September. Governor Bernard clearly indicated the problem created for the colonial authorities by the unwise haste of the English ministry enacting this measure. Send hither ordinances for execution, which the people have publicly protested against as illegal and not binding on them, without first providing a power to enforce obedience, is tempting them to revolt. In the difficult situation the royal officials performed, as might have been expected, each refused to take responsibility for what happened and excused his concession to the popular furor on the ground, grounds of lack of support from other authorities, with the stamp collector forced to resign his office by the mob. <coughs> Governor Bernard used the excuse that he was not authorized to distribute the stamps to have them stored in safety in the Fort Boston Harbor. <coughs> His denial of responsibility left the other authorities unsure as to how to conduct their affairs. Should they carry on as usual without using stamp paper, or should they refuse to permit any transaction at all? Bernard hoped that if all the ports were closed and the courts as well, the anarchy and economic pressure would force the colonists to accept the act. The only difficulty was that, lacking the strong support that should have been provided from home, no official was willing to make an all-out stand at the risk of his life, property, and position. The English ministry had ignited a conflagration at a time when the colonial administrative authorities were ill-equipped to uphold the imperial policies. For the customs officers, the problem centered on the question of entering and clearing vessels without stamped forms. The comptroller and the acting collector, Hale, having returned to England, in Boston asked the surveyor general for advice. Temple evaded, giving them a direct answer, and merely told them to apply the attorney and advocate generals for an opinion. When the customs officer did so, they received further evasive answers. The attorney general went so far as to have a friend write that he was so ill with rheumatism in his right arm and shoulder that he could not hold a pen or attend in to any business. By the 7th of December, the customs officers had to give in to the pressure of the merchants, and after obtaining from the former collector of the stamp taxes a statement that no stamp paper was available, they began to enter and clear ships with certificates of their own devising, showing that no stamps were available. And this is on page 200. Typically, the surveyor general, who had helped them in no way, took credit for holding the merchants off as long as possible. Temple wrote the commissioners of the customs that I found no means to put them off from the 1st of November till the 16th instant, when the collector and comptroller assured me that not only their lives and property, but the king's money was in the greatest danger. The comedy enacted at Boston was repeated elsewhere. In Virginia, the man who carried the stamps to the colony merely said that he had none available for the customs houses. With that excuse at hand, the surveyor general authorized the collectors to clear vessels with a certificate that stamps were not available. In Philadelphia, many ships had hastily taken on a fraction of a cargo before the stamps arrived, and thus were free to continue loading and clearing with no difficulty, having commenced loading before the act was effective. By the time this ruse had lost its value, the collector was willing to follow the example of other ports and issue clearances as usual. The Sphere General of the Western Mill District noted that the impossibilities will not be expected of us, and that from the nature of our case, our conduct will stand justified. 
while the Surveyor General of the Eastern District explained his actions in various ways, but emphasized that he really had no choice in approving the issuance of regular clearances. The Unfortunate Stamp Act was repealed in 1766. English pride was assuaged by the coupling of repeal with the Declatory Act, asserting parliamentary supremacy over the colonies. In spite of the fine words, the imperial cause had been severely damaged by the ill-timed effort to tax the colonies before either the colonial authorities or the English government was willing or able to back the attempt with the forceful measures required to enforce an unpopular measure on a recalcitrant people. A faithful portent for the future was the fact that while the repeal of the Stamp Act passed only over the objections of a sizable opposition in Parliament, the Declaratory Act was enacted unanimously in the House of Commons and was proposed by only five votes in the House of Lords. A trial in strength in America was merely postponed, not abandoned. And that's where we're going to stop on this particular document. So, on to the next one. This document is titled The United States Stamp Duties, containing all the acts of Congress and decisions of Commissioner of Internal Revenue relating thereto, carefully compared with and corrected by official copies of the same, San Francisco, published by Kenny and Alexander Booksellers and Stationers, number 606 Montgomery Street, 1863. Here on page 40, it states, section 37, and be it further enacted, that this act, except where otherwise indicated, shall take effect from and after its passage, and all acts and parts of acts repugnant to the provisions of this act be and the same are hereby repealed, provided that the existing laws shall extend to and be in force as modified for the collection of the duties imposed by this act for the prosecution and punishment of all offenses, and for the recovery, collection, distribution, and remission of all fines, penalties, and forfeitures, as fully and effectually as if every regulation, penalty, forfeiture, provision, clause, matter, and thing to that effect in the existing laws contained had been inserted and, it, and reenacted by this act. So the next document, titled the 1917 Pio Benedictine Code of Canon Law, in English translation with extensive scholarly apparatus, forward by most Reverend John J. Myers, STL, JD, JCD, Dr. Edward N. Peters, Curator, Ignatius Press, San Francisco, Latin edition, Codex Juris Canonici, PII ex Pontificis Maximi, and I won't read the rest of that. Published by P.J. Kennedy and Sons, New York, 1918. Cover designed by Roxanne May Loom, 2001 Ignatius Press, San Francisco. All rights reserved. And those the ISBN and Library of Congress control number. Now, I won't read this whole document. The important part is Canon 5. 1983 CIC 5. Canon Law Digest. And here's the cross-reference, 1917 CIC 30. Customs presently in force, whether universal or particular, but against the prescriptions of these canons, if they are indeed expressly reprobated, or to, are to be corrected as a corruption of the law, even if they are immemorial, nor are they permitted to revive in the future. Other customs, clearly centenary or immemorial, can be tolerated if ordinaries determine that, due to circumstances of person or place, they cannot be prudently removed. Other customs are considered suppressed unless the code expressly provides otherwise. Now the next section, titled Property, will also have three particular documents, but in reference to the acquisition of property, essentially, by those entities that established the laws that we read previous, or um, in the section about law. First document, State of Pennsylvania Lunacy Law of 1883, Committee on Lunacy, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, Harrisburg Publishing Company, State Printer, 1907. The second document is the General Code of the State of Ohio, published by the Commissioners of Public Printing of Ohio in four volumes, Volume 2, Cincinnati, the W.H. Anderson Company, Law Book Publishers, 1910. 
And finally, brief for International Code Council, Inc., were incorporated, and the American Gas Association, as Amici Curie, supporting petitioners in the Supreme Court of the United States, Georgia et al., the Public Resource Org, Incorporated, number 18-1150. And as with the other documents, we will not read the entire, the entire volume or the whole work, but just the really important parts for this, the really, the parts that have particularly important com connotations to them or consequences. So here we have the state of Pennsylvania Lunacy Law of 1883 as amended by the Act of May 7, 1889, and is further amended by a supplement based at the General Assembly of 1893, also an act to provide for the better protection of female and insane patients in transit, the same as amended by the Act of May 27, 1897. An amendment to acts to provide for the commitment of persons habitually addicted to the use of alcohol, drugs, etc., the act authorizing the Committee on Lunacy to transfer inmates from one state hospital to another state hospital for the insane, an act to provide for the protection of insane persons, etc., and the appointment of a guardian, and an act to provide for the employment of the insane. Committee on Lunacy, Isaac Johnson, Media Chairman, George W. Rion, Shamukin, Patrick C. Boyle, Oil City, Cyrus B. King, M.D., Allegheny, Edward Kate Rowland, Philadelphia, J. Nicholas Mitchell, M.D., Philadelphia, Secretary. Harrisburg, PA, Harrisburg Publishing Company, State Printer, 1907. So, the first part of this document we won't read, or of this page, specifically, it is the second part that is most important. And this is on page 19. An act to provide for the protection of insane persons, feeble-minded persons, and epileptics, and the appointment of a guardian for the said insane persons, feeble-minded persons and epileptics, unable to care for their own property, authorizing the guardian to support his wife and children of the said insane persons, feeble-minded persons and epileptics, defining the powers of the guardian and authorizing the sale of real estate of the ward. Section 1, or I do believe that's one, being enacted, etc., that whenever hereafter any person being a resident of this state shall become insane or feeble-minded or epileptic or so mentally defective that he or she is unable to take care of his or her property and a consequence thereof is liable to dissipate or lose the same and to become the victim of designing persons. It shall be lawful for either the mother, father, brother, sister, husband, wife, child, next of kin, creditor, or in the absence of any such per of such person or persons or their inability any other person to present to the court of common pleas of the county in which said person to be cared for resides his or her petition under oath setting forth the facts praying the court to adjudge such person to be unable to take care of his or her property and to appoint a guardian for the estate of such person section two Thereupon it shall be the duty of the court to fix a day for the hearing on such application and direct that ten days written notice thereof be given to the person against whom the petition is presented and also to the other members of his or her family residing within the jurisdiction and if such person or persons cannot be found when they, when then by notice of such publication as the court may think proper. Section 3. Upon the day fixed for the hearing, the court shall require the presence of the persons against whom the petition is presented unless there is a positive testimony to the effect that such person cannot be brought into court with safety to him or herself. At such hearing, the court shall take the testimony of all parties of interest and of such other witnesses as the petitioner and the person against whom proceedings are instituted or any member of his or her family he or she may see fit to summon on the question of the instability of the person against whom the proceedings are taken to care for his or her property because of mental deficiency. If the court on such hearing shall be satisfied that the person against whom the proceedings are taken is not able, owing to insanity or weakness of mind, to take care of his or her property, then it shall be the duty of the court to decide and enter a decree accordingly and appoint a guardian to take care of the same. 
Section 4. If the person against whom the proceedings are taken shall demand in writing prior to the decision of the court on such application trial by jury, it shall thereupon be the duty of the said court to award an issue framed to determine the question of fact involved and such trial shall be granted. Section 5. From and after the decree that the person against whom the same is entered is insane or so weak in mind that he or she is unable to take care of his or her property, the said person shall be wholly incapable of making any contract or gift whatever, or any instrument in writing, and the entry of such decree shall be notice of such incapacity, and said person shall be a ward of the court appointing such guardian. The guardian shall have full powers over the same in directing an allowance for the said ward and for the support and maintenance of his wife or his or her children and the education of his or her minor children and shall enter a decree of sale, mortgaging, leasing or conveyance upon ground rent of the real estate or any part thereof of the said ward whenever in the opinion of the court it is necessary for the support and maintenance of the said ward or his family or the education of his or her minor children or the payment of his or her debts, or where it is for the interest and advantage of the said ward that the same shall be sold, mortgage, leased, or let on ground rent, and all absolute sales and fees simple, except as hereinafter provided, shall be public sale or vendue, and may be either entirely for cash or partland credit, and after full advertisement for at least 20 days by handbills, posted in at least 20 of the most public places in the city or county where the said premises shall be situated and in at least two newspapers not less than three times in each provided that if the court shall be of the opinion that under the circumstances a better price can be obtained by private sale than a public sale the court may decree and approve the same such sale mortgaging leasing and letting on ground rent shall be upon terms and rates to be approved by the court when the said real estate is situated in the same county in which the said person shall reside or in another county or counties and the court shall be satisfied that the property of a sale mortgaging or leasing or letting on ground rent upon such real estate or any part thereof not within their jurisdiction and shall be lawful for such court to make an order or decree authorizing such guardian to sell mortgage lease or let on ground rent all the real estate of the ward or so much thereof as the court may think necessary and it may designate. Thereupon it shall be the duty of the court of common pleas of the county wherein the real estate so designated is situated upon the petition of such guardian to make an order for the sale, mortgaging, leasing, or letting upon ground rent of said real estate, or so much thereof as the court appointing said guardian by its order shall designate, and such guardian shall in all cases make a return of his proceedings to the said court in the county in which the real estate was sold, mortgage, leased, or let upon ground rent shall be found only. If the same be approved by the court, it shall be confirmed, and said guardian shall make a return of said proceedings to the court by which said guardian was appointed. Said guardian shall give such bonds and file such accounts at such periods as the court shall determine. The next document is the General Code of the State of Ohio, being an act of being an act entitled an act to revise and consolidate the general statutes of ohio passed by the general assembly of ohio february 14 1910 and approved by the governor february 15 1910 and including therewith in a fourth volume the declaration of independence the articles of confederation of 1777 the constitution of the united states 1787 ordinance of 1787 constitutions of ohio and a topical index to that act Published by the Commissioners of Public Printing of Ohio, pursuant to an act entitled An Act to Supplement Section 779 of the General Code by enacting Sections 779-1 relating to the publication of the laws passed by the General Assembly of Ohio on March 23, 1910, and approved by the Governor on March 29, 1910. Carmi A. Thompson, Secretary of the State, E. M. Fullington, Auditor of State, U. G. Denman, Attorney General, Commissioners of Public Printing. In four volumes, volume two, Cincinnati, the W. H. Anderson Company, Law Book Publishers, 1910. Here on page 1148, property subject to taxation, collateral, inheritances. Section 5331. All property within the jurisdiction of this state and any interests therein, whether belonging to inhabitants of this state or not, and whether tangible or intangible, which pass by will or by the interstate laws of this state or by deed, grant, sale, or gift, 
made or intended to take effect in possession or enjoyment after the death of the grantor to a person in trust or otherwise, other than to or for the use of the father, mother, husband, wife, brother, sister, niece, nephew, lineal descendant, adopted child, or person recognized as an adopted child, and made a legal heir under the provisions of a statute of the state, or the lineal descendants thereof, or the lineal descendants of an adopted child, the wife or widow of a son, the husband of the daughter of a descendant, shall be liable to a tax of 5% of its value above the sum of $200. 75% of such tax shall be for the use of the state, and 25% for the use of the county where it is collected. All administrators, executors, and trustees, and any such grantee under a conveyance made during the grantor's life shall be liable for all such taxes with lawful interest as hereinafter provided until they have been paid as hereinafter directed. Such taxes shall become due and payable immediately upon the death of the descendant and shall at once become a lien upon the property and and be and remain a lien until paid. Next, we have the probably the longest document uh, portion that we'll be reading in perhaps even this whole presentation. This will be the document in the Supreme Court of the United States, Georgia et al. Petitioners versus Public Resource Org or public.resource.org Incorporated Respondent and Writ of Certiorari to the United States Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit, Brief for the International Code Council Incorporated and the American Gas Association as amici curiae supporting petitioners, James Hamilton Council of Record, J. Kevin Key, Rachel K. Coomer, or Cummer, Michael E. Kennelly, Morgan Lewis and Bokius LLP, 1111 Pennsylvania Avenue, Northwest Washington, D.C. And there's a email and phone number. One interest of Amici Curie. International Code Council Incorporated, ICC, is a nonprofit organization dedicated to the development of model codes and standards. Most U.S. communities and many global jurisdictions depend on ICC's international codes, also known as the I-codes. The I-codes are a set of coordinated building safety and fire prevention codes. They benefit public safety, providing minimum safeguards for people at home, at school, and in the workplace, and they support industry's need for a single standardized set of codes without regional variations. Fifty states and the District of Columbia have adopted the I-codes at the state or jurisdictional level. Federal agencies use the I-codes as well, including the Architect of the Capitol, General Services Administration, National Park Service, Department of State, U.S. Forest Service, and the Veterans Administration. The Department of Defense refers to the International Building Code for Constructed Military Facilities, including those that house U.S. troops around the world and at home. Amtrak uses the International Green Construction Code for new and extensively renovated sites and structures. And then here's a footnote one. No counsel for a party authored this brief in whole or in part. No such counsel nor any part made a monetary contribution intended to fund the preparation or submission of the brief. And no person or entity other than the amici curiae in their members or their counsel made such a monetary contribution. All parties have consented in writing to the filing of this brief. ICC publishes a new version of each I-code every three years. These revisions may reflect changes in technology or best practices, or may expand and improve the revised I-code to make it more effective. Producing the I-codes costs millions of dollars each year. Among other things, ICC must pay for the salaries and benefits of their administrative and expert staffs, office space and meeting facilities, information technology that allows for online participation in the development process, outreach and education efforts, and the costs of publication. To recover a portion of its costs, ICC revise, relies heavily on revenues it earns from the sale or licensing of the I-codes, which amounts, which amounts account for a significant portion of ICC's total revenue each year. Although ICC permits Internet users to view iCodes in read-only form on ICC's website for free, ICC depends on copyrights to sustain its ability to sell and license the iCodes. Despite ICC's registered copyrights in the iCodes, however, several entities, including respondents in this case, have reproduced complete versions of copyrighted iCodes on their website. 
Currently, ICC is pursuing a copyright infringement action against Upcodes Incorporated, International Code Council Inc. versus Upcodes Incorporated. Upcodes is a for-profit startup whose business model centers on allowing website users to copy, print, save, distribute, and manipulate iCodes without restriction, in addition to selling premium access, which offers additional features like bookmarking, advanced searching, and project collaboration capabilities. Upcodes has given the world free access to unauthorized copies of ICC's works, arguing that the works incorporated into the laws of various jurisdictions destroys their federal copyright. ICC accordingly has profound interest in the outcome of this case. While the question on which Chertorari was granted is narrow, whether the government edicts doctrine makes state-authored works that lack the force of law uncopyrightable, respondents' brief in opposition suggests that respondent may press the court for a much broader ruling that extends beyond the state-authored works in this case. Were the court to issue a broad ruling in respondents' favor by extending the holding of Banks v. Manchester, 128 U.S. 244-1888, privately authored works, the result would be devastating to ICC and many other standards development organizations, and it would compromise their nonprofit mission of promoting safety and protecting the public, upon which many governmental entities depend. The American Gas Association, AGA, founded in 1918, represents more than 200 local energy companies that deliver clean natural gas throughout the United States. There are more than 75 million residential, commercial, and industrial natural gas customers in the U.S., of which 95%, more than 71 million customers, receive their gas from AGA members. AGA is an advocate for natural gas utility companies and their customers and provides a broad range of programs and services for member member natural gas pipelines, marketers, gatherers, international gas companies, and industry associates. Today, natural gas meets more than one-fourth of the United States energy needs. AGA's activities include research and analysis on on end-use gas technical issues for the mutual benefit of the gas utility industry and its customers. Research supporting natural gas and use codes and standards has played a vital role in maintaining the market viability of natural gas in residential and commercial applications and expanding end use of natural gas and contributes to the safe and economical use of natural gas. Based on its experience with natural gas and use codes and standards, AGA is concerned about judicial inter interpretations of copyright law that could impair the mission of standards development organizations. Summary of Argument Despite the breadth of, breadth of respondents and the 11th Circuit's assertions about copyright deprivation, this case presents an uncommon and unrepresentative set of facts. Here, at least according to the 11th Circuit, the works are authored by a state and the copyrights are claimed by a state. Most other related cases involve a private author, which is one copyright holder. That more typical scenario can raise two constitutional issues that do not arise here. The Supremacy Clause bars state and local governments from defeating rights created by federal law, and the Takings Clause bars governments from expropriating private property without just compensation. If all law and sufficiently law-like material is in the public domain, as respondent in the decision below maintain, incorporating privately authored works into law infringes both constitutional provisions. But the lower courts have barely begun to address these issues, and the lower courts in this case did not address them at all. Consistent with its usual practice, this court should not express or imply a position on either issue. The court thus should reject the sweeping claims made by the respondent, respondent and the 11th Circuit, which have implications far beyond the governmental author and copyright holder in this case. The court should also reverse the judgment below. The 11th Circuit Court or the 11th Circuit, drew from this court's 19th century case law, which construed a completely different copyright statute than the one that governs today, a broad non-statutory doctrine prohibiting copyrights for all government edicts. But this court's cases do not stand for such broad doctrine. On the contrary, they stress the importance of hewing to the precise terms of Congress's statutes. Although the court was traditionally excluded judicial work product from copyright based on a self-imposed policy representing the judiciary's consensus, it has never denied copyright protection for any other category of government edicts. 
Meanwhile, Congress has given every indication that the so-called government edicts doctrine is narrowly limited. For example, a copyright statute excludes only works created by federal officials in their official capacities. And it expressly rejects the notion that individual copyright owners' property rights may be eliminated through government action. The courts may not expand on these provisions based on their own policy preferences by holding that other categories of law like works are uncopyrightable or that governmental incorporation of privately authored works takes away their copyrights. Along with the executive branch, Congress has long supported incorporating privately authored works into law. If any trade-off needs to be made between that pro-incorporation policy and copyright law, Congress is the appropriate branch of government to make it. Argument. The court should limit its focus to state author works to avoid complex and weighty constitutional questions. The unusual facts of this case obscure the constitutional difficulties that arise from respondents in the 11th Circuit's sweeping assertions about the uncopyrightable uncopyrightability of the law According to the court below, the annotations here were developed and copyrighted by the state of Georgia. In the 11th Circuit's words, they were created by Georgia's legislatures in the exercise of their legislative authority, and Georgia holds the copyright in the annotations in its own name. This fact pattern is atypical. As the discussion in the Church Warrior Stage Briefing shows, the legal issues in this area of the law arise most often in disputes about the copyrights on privately authored works that are later incorporated into law by government actors. And there's the references below. In its ongoing litigation against private standards developers, Respondent maintains that such privately authored works lose their previous copyright protection when incorporated into law. In respondents' view, incorporation by reference makes these works a part of the law, and the law can never be copyrighted. Similarly, in this court, respondent broadly insists that the law belongs to the people, without qualification based on whether the law was authored by the people's representatives or by private citizens. Even petitioners can accept that the law itself is not copyrightable. Hence, the 11th Circuit broadly asserted below that it was clear and not contested that the law itself is intrinsically public domain material and therefore uncopyrightable even when privately authored. But when the law incorporates material from privately authored works, the claim is neither clear nor uncontested. There is no question that privately authored standards or model codes receive copyright protection upon their creation as long as they meet the usual requirements. Because valid copyrights undoubtedly exist before such works incorporation into law, any claim that the works enter into the public domain when they become part of the law necessarily hinges on the notion that incorporation into law somehow invalidates the private author's copyright. If that were true, then any state or local government would have the power to, at any time, to invalidate private actors' previously valid copyrights by incorporating their copyrighted works into its laws. The suggestion that state or local action can invalidate vested federal copyright raises at least two serious constitutional concerns. As discussed next, such action would violate both the Supremacy Clause and the Takings Clause, as incorporated through the 14th Amendment. In this case, of course, these constitutional issues are not presented. Here, the entire responsibility for the annotation's legal effect, or lack thereof, is the same entity that developed and copyrighted them. Georgia has neither impaired a private actor's vested federal rights nor taken a private actor's property. Given the particular facts of this case and the dangers in issuing an overbroad ruling, the court should reject the sweeping assertions made by respondent, the courts below, and occasionally even petitioners, and it should steer well clear of any ruling that would carry negative implications for the rights of private copyright owners. Respondents' views contravene the Supremacy Clause. The Supremacy Clause makes federal law the supreme law of the land, notwithstanding anything in the Constitution or laws of any state to the contrary. U.S. Constitution Article 6, Clause 2. Federal supremacy means, among other things, that state and local governments may not curtail federal rights. So as an added note here, they are actually misquoting that section. It states that the U.S. Constitution shall be the supreme law of the land. It does not make federal law the supreme law of the land. 
Anyway, that includes federal intellectual property rights, copyright and patent laws derived from Congress's express power to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for a limited time to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. The court has repeatedly held that states may not interfere with rights and privileges established through Congress's intellectual property legislation. And it's a lot in Brett. Holding that the Supremacy Clause preempts a state law interfering with federally created right to obtain compulsory licenses for certain copyright holders. Holding that the Supremacy Clause preempts a state law impairment of the federal right to copy unpatented articles. Holding that the Supremacy Clause preempts a state law interfering with patent prosecutors' federal right to practice before the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Even if relatively minor elements of these legislative schemes are shielded from state interferences, states a fortiori may not destroy a previously valid federal copyright in its entirety. The Supremacy Clause implications of respondents' broad theories have not been litigated extensively in the lower courts. Only one court of appeals has addressed such arguments, and even then only in cursory fashion. In BOCA, the First Circuit hastily concluded that there was no preemption problem with the state's abridgment of copyright and privately authored work that had been incorporated into state law because such abridgment was consistent with and required by federal law. But the First Circuit entirely overlooked 17 U.S.C. subsection 201E, which expressly con expresses Congress's deliberate rejection of the involuntary elimination of individual authors' copyright interests through state action. When an individual author's ownership of a copyright or of any of the exclusive rights under a copyright has not previously been transferred voluntarily by that individual author, no action by any government body or other official or organization purporting to seize, expropriate, transfer, or exercise rights of ownership with respect to the copyright or any of the exclusive rights under copyright shall be given effect under this title except as provided under Title 11, the Bankruptcy Code, IBD. The BOCA court has thus overlooked a critical provision of the copyright statute. Section 201E explicitly rejects BOCA's premise, namely that the federal copyright statute, or at least a judicial gloss upon the Federal Copyright Act, requires the invalidation of the copyright for works incorporated into law. The plain language of subsection 201E proves the contrary. State actions purporting appearing to expropriate deprive the owner of copyright ownership do not, in fact, do so under the statute. Defining purport as appear osten ostensibly or to do to be or do something and defining expropriate to dispossess a person of ownership or deprive of property. Section 201E confirms the supremacy clause problems that enter in here in sweeping claims about the law belonging to the people as applied to privately authored works incorporated into state or local law. That claim shared by respondent in the 11th Circuit below violates Section 201E and the Supremacy Clause. With so little attention paid to this issue in the lower courts and zero attention paid to it in this case, the court should avoid expressing or implying any view on the question here. B. Respondents' views create ex expansive takings clause liability. The Constitution also prohibits government takings of private property without just compensation. See U.S. Constitution Amendment 5, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation, although the court has not yet held specifically that copyrights are property for takings clause purposes, there is no reason for doubt. The court has long used the language of property to describe copyrights, describing copyright legislation as creating a literary property of an author and his works. Wheaton v. Peters Congress's copyright legislation proceeds from the conviction that encouragement of individual effort by personal gain is the best way to advance public welfare through the talents of authors, and that sacrificial days devoted to such creative activities deserve rewards commensurate with the services rendered. The court has squarely held that state law trade secrets are property under the takings clause. Trade secrets are assigned, can be held in trust, passed to trustees in bankruptcy, and are often described as proprietary interests and in terms of ownership. This reasoning applies with 
And so now we are going to move on to the next part, which is titled People. Our first document is the Cardinal Principles of Secondary Education, Department of the Interior, Bureau of Education, Bulletin Number 35, 1918, a report of the Commission on the Reorganization of Secondary Education, appointed by the National Education Association. Next, we have the declaration of Professor Settimio Carmignani Caridi in support of Defendant IOR's motion to dismiss, dismiss fourth amended complaint for lack of subject matter jurisdiction, July 28, 2006, Emil Alperin et al. v. Vatican Bank, also known as Institute of Religious Works or Instituto per le Opere di Religione IOR et al., United States District Court, Northern District of California. Next will be the Grand Canyon University's Student Success Handbook, Global Citizen 2021. Now, Department of the Interior, Bureau of Education, Bolton, 1918, number 35, Cardinal Principles of Secondary Education, a report of the Commission of the Reorganization of Secondary Education appointed by the National Education Association, Department of the Interior. And here the appropriate section, the principal's council. The principal may select from his teachers a council, each member of which shall be charged with responsibility of studying the activities of the school with reference to specific objective. Plans for realizing those objectives should be discussed by the principal and the council without impairing in any way the ultimate responsibility of the principal. It will, as a rule, increase the efficiency of the school if the principal encourages initiative as the part of these council members and delegates to them such responsibilities as he finds they can discharge. The members of such council and their duties are suggested as follows. Health Director. This council member should seek to ascertain whether the health needs of the pupils are adequately met. For this purpose, he should consider the ventilation and sanitation of the building, the provisions for lunch, the posture of pupils, the amount of homework required, the provisions for physical training, and the effects of athletes. He should find out whether the pupils are having excessive social activities outside of school and devise means for gaining the cooperation of parents in the proper regulation of work and recreation. He may well see whether the teaching of biology is properly focused upon hygiene and sanitation. Citizenship director, director. The citizenship director should determine whether the pupils are developing initiative and the sense of personal responsibility he should foster civic mindedness through the school paper, debating society, and general school exercises, and give suggestions for directing the thinking of the pupils to significant problems of the day. Next, we have the United States District Court, Northern District of California, ML Alperin et al. Plaintiffs versus Vatican Bank, a.k. Institute of Religious Works or Instituto Perle Opere di Religione IRR et al. Defendants, Declaration of Professor Septimio Carmignani Caridi in support of the defendant IOR's mission to dismiss Fourth Amended Complaint for Lack of Subject Matter Jurisdiction, July 28, 2006. Here states, I, Professor Settimio Carmignani Caridi, do hereby declare and state as follows. One, my name is Settimio Carmignani. Carmignani Caridi. I'm a tenured ricercatore researcher and member of the Faculty of Law at the Italian University of Rome, Tor Vergata. My business address is Settimio Carmi Caridi, Department of Public Law, Faculty of Law, Università di Roma, Tor Vergata, via Orazio Raimondo, 18-00173, Rome, Italy. To as set forth below, this declaration is based upon my expert knowledge of civil law, legal systems, Italian law, canon law, ecclesiastical law, the constitutional law of the Holy See, and the particular laws of the state of Vatican City. Juridic Persons 25. A general analogy between juridic persons in the civil law tradition and corporation in the common law legal tradition may be useful. 
A juridic person is a fictitious rather than a natural person, and it's similar to a corporation that is created for some particular purpose, as may do be defined in the founding documents and further elaborated in its bylaws, describing the corporate structure and function. Like the common law corporations, the juridic person is a legal mechanism through which organizations maintain a separate identity, structure, purpose, and legal independence. 26. Juridic persons are also classified as either public or private. 27. In canon law, a public juridic person is an entity that comes into existence either ipso ure or is created by the specific grant of the competent authority. In either case, the entity's legal purpose must include a mandate to pursue canonically appropriate public good. Public juridic persons are subject to the scrutiny of the created authority, but act autonomously within the sphere of their competence, as defined by the juridic person's own statutes and the grant of authority. Providing that juridic persons may be created by a disposition of law or by specific legal decree, by a competent authority and with the purpose that corresponds with the mission of the competent authority. The code specifies that a public juridic person maintain a particularly close relationship with the competent authority that created it in order the public juridic person can be supervised to ensure that the public good is pursued. Next, and then uh, this would be page 8 under 29. The sovereign's powers are divided into pastoral, spiritual, and temporal spheres. Temporal authority concerns the acquisition, retention, administration, and alienation of temporal goods. These powers are exercised by the various juridic persons within the church, independently of the competent authority that created them within the limits set by their founding statutes. Such canon law juridic persons are also typified by separate legal representations and the power to represent and vindicate the rights of the juridic entity. Thirty juridic persons are first classified into two basic categories, aggregates of persons, universitates personarum, or of things, universitates rerum. The competent authority here, the sovereign, may create either legal statuses or legal status of the IOR as of year 1999. 31. The IOR is a public juridic person constituted by the authority of the sovereign in conformity with the canon law, the law of the Holy See, and the law of the state of Vatican City. The legal status of the IOR is described in both sovereign law and legal commentary. And here you have the references. 36. The purpose of the IOR is to carry on activities that are pious causas, or for pious purposes, consistent with sovereign's public purposes. Internal governing regulations that are required to act for pious causa, blah, blah, blah. The IOR cannot change its rules of internal governance without permission of, and final approval by the sovereign. Chirograph, creating IOR as canon law, juridic person, limiting its authority to public acts and requiring that all changes to the governing statutes be made by the sovereign, not the entity itself. 37. The IOR's public purpose to provide custody and administration of movables and immovables transferred or entrusted to the same institute the purpose of works of religion and charity. In conformity with its purpose, the institute therefore accepts assets whose destination is at least or in part or in the future of that provision previous section. The Institute cannot accept deposits of assets from entities or individuals of the Holy See or of the State of Vatican City. As a public juridic person, the Statuto authorizes the IOR to act as a fiduciary of the deposited funds for designated pious purposes and as an autonomous pious foundation that directly carries out the charitable purposes of the Holy See and the State of Vatican City. 39. Constitutional documents underscore IOR's central institutional relationship with the Holy See and its public purpose. Pastor Bonus Art 25, subsection 2, describes the IOR as that special institute established and located within the Vatican State for managing economic assets committed to it and for administering those that serve to sustain the works of religion and charity. ID. This constitutional status reflects the IOR's central role within the Holy See's public law legal structure. Indeed, authoritative IOR scholarship describes the IOR as a Holy See central entity. And this will continue on. Next, we have that pa 
passage from the Grand Canyon University's Student Success Handbook, Global Citizenship. Global citizenship, like any other abstract idea, finds its meaning in the everyday acts and actions of people like you and me. For Grand Canyon University, the global part of the global citizenship begins with the theological idea that we are all God's children. As such, each person is worthy of respect and may appear overly simplistic, but global citizenship could be nothing more than recognizing beauty, dare I say God's beauty, and difference. Traveling and teaching in Central and South America, Asia, Africa, Europe, and in many parts of the United States provided me with a concrete learning experience in global citizenship. Now we come to the section on food and water in relation to the context of this video and this presentation. The first is the Toxicology of Florence Symposium, Bern, October 15 through 17, 1962, edited by Dr. T. Gordonoff, professor at the University of Bern, chronic fluorine poisoning caused by the drinking of subterranean waters containing excessive quantities of fluorine by D.G. Stein, Professor of Pharmacology and Endemic Fluorosis by A. Singh, Department of Medicine, Government Medical College, Patiala, India. Next is the United States Code 2010 edition, Title 21, Food and Drugs, Chapter 9, Federal Food and Drug and Cosmetic Act, Subchapter 9, Tobacco Products, Subsection 387, Definitions, Additives. Then we have the Lancaster Fresh Market Incorporated, Farmer's Market Vendor Application, Lancaster, Ohio. Here we have the Toxicology of Fluorine, Symposium Berm, 15 through 17, October 1962, edited by Dr. T. Gordonoff, professor at the University of Bern. Now we have, on page 53, Medical F Faculty, University of Pretoria, Pretoria Republic of South Africa. Chronic fluorine poisoning caused by the drinking of subterranean waters containing excessive quantities of fluorine, D.G. Stein, Dr. Medical Vet Ver DV SE Professor of Pharmacology Introduction. With the limited time of 20 minutes at my disposal, I shall be able to touch only briefly on a few of the most important aspects of my research on chronic fluorine poisoning. In my publications, I have summarized the results of my field and laboratory investigation into chronic fluorine intoxication in man and animal conducted in the course of the past 25 years. In these publications, I have also made an attempt to refer to and discuss the most relevant points in some hundreds of publications made by the foremost investigators and writers on chronic fluorine poisoning. As early as 1938, I, Stein, one, reported the devastating effects of excessive concentration of minerals, especially fluorides, in underground drinking waters had in the northwestern Cape provinces and the health of man and animal. At that time, I warned that if the necessary steps to prevent the drinking of water containing excessive quantities of fluorides were not taken, in years to come, many of the inhabitants, especially children, of that area would show not only severe damage to their teeth, as they already did in 1938, but what is much more serious will suffer from serious disturbances of the bone system, legs, arms, back. This prediction was proved true in 1959, we, Stein et al. 10, investigated a mysterious bone disease in some 200 children in the Kenbart District, northwestern Cape Province. At the time of writing, more cases of mysterious bone diseases or disease suspected chronic fluorine poisoning among children in the northwestern Cape Province are being investigated. The results of this investigation will be made known as soon as they are available. In 1960, I. Stein, 13, investigated mysterious bone disease in children and adults in the Rodton area. Potgeitersus, that's hard to say, district, Transvaal. Also, these cases proved to be fluorosis caused by the drinking of underground water containing excessive quantities of fluorine. At the moment, further cases of suspected fluorosis in children and adults are being investigated in an area not very far from Road 10, where chronic fluoride poisoning has already been diagnosed. The result of this investigation will be made available in the near future. Now we come to A. Hydrofluorosis, Department of Medicine, Government Medical College, Patiala, India, Endemic Fluorosis, A. Singh. Chronic fluorine intoxication is manifested by mottled enamel and diffuse osteosclerosis of the skeleton has been observed in different regions all over the world. 
In India, this condition was described in 1937 from the Madras state by Short and his colleagues. Our interest in this problem was aroused by the fact that we observed a number of cases of paraplegia presenting a well-defined and most uniform clinical picture coming from almost the almost same geographical area. Most of these cases had model teeth and osteosclerosis of the skeleton. This observation prompted us to carry out an extensive epidemiological survey in two heavily endemic districts of Punjab, which is one of the northern states of India. This area of Punjab has a fairly hot summer, the temperature touching 116 to 120 degrees Fahrenheit, and has a dry and sandy soil. The chief sources of water supply for the population are artificial wells. The fluorine content of drinking water varies from 2 to 18 ppm. The general hygienic standards are very poor, and the diet of most of the population is rather poor. The data presented in this paper are based upon the study of 409 cases of endemic fluorosis seen over the period of seven years, 1956 to 1962. Most of these patients were studied on the spot while carrying out the epidemiological surveys while 41 cases were hospitalized and studied comprehensively according to a fixed plan. The biochemical estimation comprised fluoride in blood, urine, and bone ash of the patients and in the samples of water consumed by them. The estimation of serum CA and phosphorus as well as urinary excretion of CA and inorganic phosphorus was done in a number of cases to evaluate the mode of excretion. Since the urinary excretion provided some interesting findings, it was decided to study the total nitrogen, amino acid nitrogen, tyrosine, and its metabolites and phenolic compounds in the urine of cases of endemic fluorosis. A limited experimental study was also done in the guinea pigs and monkeys to confirm the urinary excretion findings. The clinical manifestation of fluorosis may be divided into the following subgroups. One, dental fluorosis. Two, skeletal fluorosis, late and crippling. Three, neurological fluorosis. Four, visceral fluorosis. And five, metab metabolic changes in fluorosis. A, kidneys and fluorosis. B. Calcium metabolism and C. Protein metabolism. Dental fluorosis. Mottled enamel or dental fluorosis is a well recognized entity and is observed wherever the drinking water contains more than 1 ppm of fluoride during the teeth eruptive period. It was divided into three grades. In the first grade, there were only white opocytes of patches on the enamel, while in the second stage there was a distinct, distinct brownish discoloration which is rather characteristic. In the third grade there was considerable pitting. In addition to the changes described in the area surveyed by us, the incidence of dental fluorosis was extremely high as much as 80 to 90 percent of the population being affected. We observed two interesting changes in the dental Rolentogenograms, which have not been described in the literature before, i.e., hypercementosis and apical resorption of the roots. Skeletal changes. The changes in the skeleton are the most distinctive and characteristic feature of endemic fluorosis and are very easily observed by skiographic studies. The most striking changes were seen in the vertebral column, particularly in the cervical region. There was uniform osteosclerosis and osteophytosis of the spine with beak-like lipping and a chalky white ground glass appearance. As a result of irregular exostosis, there were considerable encroachment on the diameters of the spinal canal and intervertebral foramina which explained the development of neurological complications. Irregular periostical bone formation was observed during the muscular and tendinous insertions and in the interosseous membranes of forearm and legs. The histiopathical pathological changes of bone biopsies were also characteristic. It showed disorder discordered lamellar orientations and poorly formed haversian system resembling the histiopathological changes of experimental fluorosis. 
The chemical composition of the bone was also altered and it showed a fluoride content of 250 to 700 milligrams as against a normal content of 100 to 20 milligrams. Neurological changes. The neurological complication of fluorosis resemble very much the features of cervical spindulosis and their pathogenic mechanism is also similar. Broadly speaking, they are the nature of a radio Coulomelopathy. It's hard. All these words are hard to say to put in here, <laughs> making it very confusing and difficult to read. We observed 41 cases in our series of 409 cases. The radicular features result in muscular wasting, acropathesia, and subjective pain referred along the nerve roots, while the myclopathic features usually result in a complete spastic paraplegia. Objective sensory changes are observed in about 60% of the cases, while visceral disturbances are almost universal. The details are described in the original paper. Latent fluorosis. Whilst dental fluorosis is at once obvious, the skeletal fluorosis clinically does not become obvious until it advances to the stage of crippling fluorosis. However, radiological involvement of the skeleton is manifest at a much earlier stage and is the only means of diagnosing latent fluorosis. Such cases are otherwise healthy and young adults who have as yet not received exposure to fluoride over a sufficiently long period. Their only complaints are vague pains in the joints and back and are usually labeled as suffering from rheumatoid or osteoarthritis or having vague neurologic or myalgic pains. These in reality are symptoms of latent fluorosis while on radiology, radiology may show osteosclerosis or be present even prior to the development of definite radiological changes. Crippling fluorosis. There is nothing but a very advanced stage of fluoride intoxication, which has resulted from a continuous exposure of the individual to 20 to 80 milligrams of fluoride iron daily over a period of 20 to 20, 10 to 20 years. 65 such cases were observed by us. The invalidism in such cases results partly from the neurological complications and partly from the deformities produced by ankylosis or various joints of various joints. The advanced picture of crippling fluorosis with a quadriplegia and a kyphost and bent spine with flexion deformity of the bones and hips provides a very grim picture. And there's the picture to advanced cases of skeletal fluorosis. Note the extreme kyphosis. Systemic intoxication. We do not observe any significant systemic effect of fluoride intoxication. There was no evidence of un underdevelopment or gross anemia or of thyroid deficiency. Detailed examination of cardiovascular system include ECG did not reveal any significant changes. Fluorosis in the kidney. The kidneys contain the second highest concentration of fluoride in soft tissues. It was therefore decided to do as many kidney function tests as possible in, case of, in cases of fluorosis. The blood urea was normal, 15 to 50 mg or milligrams, in most of the cases, but its upper limit was raised. There was some degree of impairment of urea clearance and the ratio of inorganic phosphorus in the urine so that the inorganic phosphorus in blood was raised. Similarly, similarly, there was an amino aciduria of the renal type. All these indicate a subtle disturbance of renal function which needs further elaboration. Now our next document, 21 U.S.C. United States Code 2010 edition, Title 21 Food and Drugs, Chapter 9, Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, Subchapter 9, Tobacco Products. Definitions. Subsection 387. In this subchapter, one additive. The term additive means any substance, the intended use of which results or may reasonably be expected to result directly or indirectly in its becoming a component or otherwise affecting the characteristics of any tobacco product, including any substance intended for use as a flavoring or coloring in producing, manufacturing, packing, processing, preparing, treating, or packaging, transporting, or holding, except such term does not include tobacco 
or a pesticide chemical residue in or on raw tobacco or a pesticide chemical. And just for clarification, fluorine is a chemical used in the production of pesticides. Finally, we have this Lancaster Fresh Market Incorporated vendor application to sell at this farmer market. Notice the part where it states, I have proof of insurance for 1 million general liability insurance naming Lancaster Fresh Market Incorporated as an additional insured. And then imagine every vendor pulls out a insurance program naming this entity as the insured. Next we have section on weapons which starts with the United States Constitution, Second Amendment, the United States Code, Title 26, Internal Revenue Code, Subtitle E, Alcohol, Tobacco, and Certain Other Excise Taxes, or Taxes, Chapter 53, Machine Guns, Destructive Devices, and Certain Other Firearms, Subchapter D, Penalties and Forfeitures, Subsection 5872, Forfeitures. University of Nebraska Kearney, Public Speaking Course, Exam Number 3, Teacher, for Clark, December 15th, 2022. The Second Amendment states, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Now we come to the subsection 5872 forfeitures of the U.S. Code 26, Internal Revenue Code. A. Laws Applicable. Any firearm involved in any violation of the provisions of this subchapter shall be, shall be subject to seizure and forfeiture, and except as provided in subsection B, all the provisions of internal revenue laws relating to searches, seizures, and forfeitures are unstamp of unstamped articles are extended to and made to apply to the articles taxed under this chapter and the persons to whom this chapter applies. B. Disposal. In the case of the forfeiture of any firearm by reason of a violation of this chapter, no notice of public sale shall be required. No such firearm shall be sold at a public sale. If such firearm is forfeited for a violation of this chapter and there is no remission or mitigation of forfeiture thereof, it shall be delivered by the Secretary to the Administrator of General Services, General Services Administration, who may order such firearm destroyed or may sell it to any state or possession or political subdivision thereof, or, at the request of the Secretary, may authorize its retention for official use of the Treasury Department, or may transfer it without charge to any executive department or independent establishment of the government by use for use by it. Lastly, we come to exam number three under the public speaking class at the University of Nebraska Kearney by the teacher Ford Clark from December 15th, 2022. Here under question 19, it states, according to your textbook, the following statement is an example of what type of fallacy. Quote, if we allow the government to restrict the sale of semi-automatic weapons, before we know it, there will be a ban on ownership of handguns and even hunting rifles, and our constitutional right to keep and bear arms has been compromised. The right of free speech will be the next to go. And here it has a multiple choice, bandwagon, ad hominem, either or, slippery slope. So this reaches the end of this presentation. And for context and clarification of exactly what each document laid out, uh, implies or causes to happen. From the beginning, we see it in the law section. The various documents they set up, they, the second one reinstitutes what was attempted to be imposed in the first. And the third stipulates that anything that does not go along with this internationalist uh, concept will be changed, will be revised, 
and will make be made sure that it cannot be um, brought back. Now, concerning the implications of those heinous acts, or declarations anyway, in the next section, we find out how that is particularly implemented through the taking of property in uh, Pennsylvania by deeming people mentally feeble and then of course uh, appointing the guardian. The inheritance, completely fraudulent inheritance tax from the General Code of the State of Ohio and then how the International Co Code Council essentially leverages international law uh, on all of us. Now under the people section we find their efforts to brainwash and manipulate the understanding and thinking under the cardinal principles. Then we also have the declaration by the professor detailing the difference between persons. And then we of course we have the um, efforts by the Grand Canyon University to establish the so-called global citizen uh, concept. Now in food and water we find the uh, document on poisonings of people or at least the effect of a certain poisoning that is used in pesticides where in the second document we find doesn't need to be listed as an additive or doesn't need to be listed at all. And then in the next document we find the ability to manipulate markets and then how to control who can sell food. And finally, in the last part, we find out how they carry out their operation to undermine the security of the free state by taking weapons that they will then turn on the people that they took them from, or at least the populace they took them from. And then in the last one, how the thinking about this particular uh, subject is in fact uh, manipulated through the public speaking class at the University of Nebraska Kearney in reference and deference to the objectives set out the cardinal principles by the citizenship director, which also relates to the global citizen section in the GCU student handbook about controlling the thinking of the pupils.